sharing insights and solving problems together by combining historical, climate, food, and economic data so you can make informed decisions as we shift into a new era. Here's what was, this is what's coming. Our world is never going back to 2019, so what will the new era look like? And most importantly, what is immediate that will affect the pocketbook and the outlook into next year so we can all get ready? Thank you for joining. I'm your host, David Dubine. Right along here with Ransom Godwin, Mountain High Time. What's happening? Well, where do we even begin? Should we talk of letting them eat cake? What will 8 billion people eat tonight's episode? If people get hungry, I will tell you already, this is from Missouri, a small town newspaper in Missouri, told people instead of eating eggs to go ahead and blend those eggs to make bread so you can stretch your eggs further. If we're going into the point already where they're trying to put it into local newspapers that you're going to have to eat cake, <laughs> that's definitely not a good look going into summer. Ransom, thanks for joining tonight. Backyard chickens and all, the Amish, they're back open. And a smooth sailing as we buy calories by the one thousandth of a calorie from this point forward. It's going to be awesome. All right, well, we'll see if he pops back on here for a second. But as we go through tonight, not really going to talk about the news so much. You can just jump off and get your own news if you need to anywhere. It's more about trying to bring together solutions and ideas of solutions because we all see the problem, right? That's what the news is. They're showing you the problem. Yeah, we can identify a few of the problems. I was detecting some dropped frames on our broadcast. Okay, that's... All right, cool. Hello? Fix it up. Thank you for reminding me. Ransom, where are we streaming live tonight? Oh, we're back on mute. Okay, he's trying to fix the, the the scrambled frames on some of the live feeds. So we're up on Facebook, the Mini Ice Age channel, uh, Adapt2030, YouTube, Mountain High Time. Over on YouTube, uh, Vigilante TV and IBM radio network tonight coming in jimmy thanks for the invite so we're streaming off to a few new places and locales trying to grow the audience and grow the idea of communication for solutions it's going to involve everybody it's going to take everybody you know and get and stepping outside that fear of just non-stop bombardment of all your senses through this maniacal news feed to keep you in that perpetual fear state from just like one gigantic event to the next. Okay, we get it. We get it. Thanks. Get it. I understand it. All right. Thanks for the warning. All good. Now you see that coming. Time to get ready for it. So what about your access to the Amish? Now think about secondary food sources coming in or tertiary food suppliers moving forward. Now I was on a call earlier with somebody tonight and they were talking about a supermarket called Giant. Uh, we don't have them here, so I've never been in one. I, I, they, he said it's a local regional supermarket. Went in and bought two heads of cabbage instead of one. But when he went to the self-checkout, because he had two heads of cabbage, he actually had to have somebody come over and approve the sale, like one of the clerks or whatnot that has a little swipe badge there to continue the sale or to continue the checkout. And he was perplexed, like I'm already getting bagged for, you know, they, they're stopping people from checking out in line because they have more than one item of produce. And that was a, a strange one that I thought there. Trader Joe's Aldi here, you know, Aldi was kind of a, one of those dented can stores. It's not anymore. It's trying to take over Trader Joe's niche, at least in East Tennessee. So where would you go to find foods? You know, you got the Kroger's, you got the Bigs, you know, but then what if they limit, just like what happened in this supermarket store giant? Well, then you got the second tiers, which is still pretty good quality, like Trader Joe's, honestly, pretty good, like really good. Used to have really cheap prices, a lot of organic stuff, a lot of things that are outside the, you know, GMO sphere of things. But, of course, prices rose. 
Aldi used to be like this dented can store where you could go in and they never had the same thing twice. It was always, you know, just whatever they bought is like seconds or the end run of something or there was an extra case for sale. They would put it on the shelf. So like if you went back there way many years ago, there was nothing was ever the same on the shelves. Like it was a hodgepodge every time you went in. But recently they have built a bunch of new ones and they're competing right away with, tra right away with Trader Joe's. Okay, the farmer's markets are opening back up, which is cool. Probably May for most people, farmer's markets are going to be open. But be honest, that stuff's expensive anyway compared to. I don't know if the farmer's markets are going to raise their prices this year because they can. Because, you know, the, what if the supermarket vegetables actually cost the same price as the farmer's markets last year? You know, obviously you're going to go buy, but then that'll be sold out super quick. So. Early bird gets the worm at the farmer's markets. And where else do you go after that? Okay, you go to the Amish. But everybody knows that, so they're all going to go to the Amish too. Okay, where do you go after that? Well, perhaps your local farmer or your community garden. Because community gardens are in a community where they're already policing and self-securitizing that vegetable grow area because the community is protecting it. So outsiders aren't just going to run in and swipe something. How many farmers do you know? Ransom, you live in out west. So how many farmers do you know? Or do you like, how far do you need to go to get to a big farm? In Tennessee, I need to drive from my place about maybe three to five minutes. And I'm at a major farm that has cattle or they're raising sheep or they're growing crop or something. I'm, well, that's in my ecosystem here. So what about yourself out there west? There's a surprising uh, amount of agriculture uh, around us, even in this arid uh, area, because they use reservoir systems and stuff to, uh, you, you know, from the rainfall and snowpack off the mountain to uh, feed the tributaries in the little streams and stuff uh, right where I live. Actually, I live right next to the Sacramento Mountain Range and the Guadalupe and the Capitans, which means that uh, for a 500 square mile area around that mountain, um, there's really nothing. It's just uh, dry cactus, no water. However, there's plenty of artesian wells that get into the uh, Permian uh, aquifer. Um, so there is quite a bit of farming in south southeast New Mexico um, and central New Mexico and all up the Rio Grande. So we, we actually have a lot of uh, stuff going on, but it's it's different kind of stuff. Um, and I wouldn't, uh, you know, count on it. And the reason I say that is because the mo most of it, um, the the large amount of agriculture that's out there in the uh, Permian Basin, uh, which stretches from West Texas all the way to eastern New Mexico until you hit uh, the mountain range there, um, is in between and around and right next to lots of fracking mines. I mean, it's littered. If you get out your Google Earth and you look at West Texas and eastern New Mexico and the in the southeast. Uh, corner of New Mexico, you can just kind of zoom into that entire area. And what you see is what looks like a giant circuit board on the face of the earth. And in between those and the windmills that they put up everywhere, um, there's little strips of farming, uh, but it's all commercial stuff. So, um, you know, if you're on your own, uh, you're not going to be eating any of that. But they do grow a lot of pistachios and uh, pecans and, and stuff like that. And there's a lot of milk cows from ranching. Um, but it takes a lot more land to produce the same amount of food. And if any kind of shutdown happened, I would imagine if you live in the Southwest, you would be mainly de dependent on deliveries. So if the uh, supply chain stops, um, all the little towns that live in the Southwest will basically be cut off overnight unless someone views your town as important or uh, they know they can squeeze out the last of the uh, money out of it. Uh, you know, like compared to Colorado for uh for example, um, when I travel up there, most little towns in Colorado have a great supermarket in their town, and they have farm co-ops and these other things going on, um, and there's literally just food everywhere. There's abundance, and you would think that there wouldn't be, um, considering that they're all up in the uh, in the Rocky Mountains, and it's hard to, uh, you know— truck up some of these passes and stuff uh but their supermarkets are way better than where i live where uh delivery would seemingly would be easier so it is kind of a bizarre thing 
Um, but you know, when I when I am looking through the news headlines, though, uh, what I'm seeing is um, destruction of food, like uh, you know, millions of pounds of potatoes and um, things like this, just across the board. Um, reports about you know um, the UK delivering uh, depleted uranium ammunition uh, to the Ukraine. So you can look forward to um, the same thing that happened in Iraq and Afghanistan when it, as far as it uh, pertains to depleted uranium and the ecological disaster that that caused on mainly human beings. Um, and, and, you know, you can look in that yourself. Um, and, and then I see all of this stuff going on uh, Weather-wise, um, the world is throwing uh, a lot of ifs out there right now. I mean, if, I'm sure you've been paying attention um, to the California saga from a few years ago. Just, uh, it, you know, all of them crying about the drought, the drought, the drought, the forest fires, the forest fires, the forest fires. And then came blizzard and then came flooding and then came on almost like a monsoon of their own. This uh uh, atmospheric river that's been just dumping on areas there's lakes that haven't existed forever that are just popping back up because you know that's the depression and the elevation so all the water is going to go to that so all kinds of uh, neat things are happening worldwide um, and i sent you an article about you know because you've brought this up to me many times in the past um the the hole in the ozone uh thing that you know us in the eight what you know back in the 80s and early 90s they used to beat us over the head with the idea that uh you know you couldn't uh use your spray deodorant or you know or whatever it was you might let some cfcs out and destroy our ozone and we'd all die um that never happened the ozone seemed to repair itself somehow in a natural phenomenon or mechanism and now it's back so it's leading me to believe that you know maybe it's magnetic in nature and has to do with the sun and has nothing to do with uh, CFCs or any of that other stuff into any real effect on it. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm just saying, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but uh, I sent you that article, and it, it does show a very large anomaly stretching all the way from the Brazil area, which, keep in mind, grows a lot of food, all the way over into Africa, and it's just this big, giant, uh, you know, the phenomenon that's happening now at the same time as our magnetic field is collapsing and uh you know all of these other events are happening which i would imagine it, it, if you saw the sun um you know that giant hole on the side of it i mean it, it looked like about a tenth the size of the surface of the sun um facing earth there and uh, i think the kp index is like seven or something like that right now so we're, we're having a nice little storm um all kinds of uh neat stuff for us to look forward to and, and then i want to get into uh in a minute if you would uh the end of the paper money system is happening right now and i, and I kind of uh, have been catching on to little things um that are going on like little programs for those conspiracy theorists out there that are going to be the reasons why you can't have paper money all the way from cartel violence way far away from where you live all the way to counterfeiting and things like that here in the u.s um, just all these stories popping up everywhere about reasons you can't do this and you can't do that. And um, meanwhile, the grocery prices are skyrocketing. You know, Ransom, <clears throat> you're saying you're not a scientist. Well, I'm not a scientist either, but I'm a mesospheric ice crystal cloud studier. And I think everything we're seeing relates to exactly that point right there. The ozone depletion event, the runaway catastrophic ozone depletion loss event that was inbound this year for August, September, October, November across the Southern Hemisphere was going to shock scientists to the core. They really would not even understand how fast it can collapse. Well, it's all based on how many ice crystal clouds are in the mesosphere. That's the equation. It was never the chlorofluorocarbons. It was the amount of Water vapor at those higher altitudes, 30 to 50 miles above our head, that created more ice crystals, which allowed more chemical breakdown of chlorine or bromine on that ice crystal surface and strip the O3. That, that's ozone, O3. It would strip off one of the oxygen atoms, and then ozone is broken down. Obviously, O2, that's what you consider oxygen, and then you get either a chlorine slash oxygen 
combination or you would get a bromine oxide or something of the bromine and oxygen mix. Choose your choose whatever one you want. Chlorine's bromine is called actually I call the chlorine bromine catalyst, and it only occurs generally on ice crystal surfaces when temperatures are incredibly low. So it's not that there just could be a lot of ice crystals in these layers of the atmosphere, but it's the temperature. The temperature drives the the catalyst, the the reaction to occur. Without the proper temperature, going incredible cold. 100 Celsius below zero cold. Upper reaches, we're talking 50, you know, 30, 50 miles above our heads. If it doesn't reach that temperature cold, then that catalyst won't work, even if there's a lot of ice crystals. It just, you need both. But we just had the Hunga Tonga eruption last year in January of 2022. It injected 10% 10 more water vapor into the atmosphere in a single event in a single day. Yeah, you didn't get that on the news, did you? Last year, January 15th, 16th, 17th, there was injected into our atmosphere 10% more moisture than what you understood as the atmosphere. We'll add 10% more precipitable moisture that could come down to rainfall, snowfall, atmospheric rivers, arc storms, floods, obviously, incredible snowpack. You just added 10% to the entire world's precipitable water, so everywhere is going to have more snowfall from now, at least 10% more. So if you just look at the averages, and you're, okay, we added 10% more water vapor into the atmosphere in one event, then everywhere across the planet will have 10% more snow, 10% more rain, 10% more hail. Does it, it just add 10% to everything. And then, you know, what we might consider extremes, that scares me. Because if a 10% add to all these extreme weather events, and that's really it, that's only 10%. When we start getting to these magnetic anomalies that are going to start ripping right about now, all the way through the catastrophic ozone event into October of 2024, when the magnetic fields couple with the outer solar system magnetic fields that haven't coupled like this since 79 AD, or maybe 535 AD, those are the last two periods that something similar with when you observe from the Earth, it looks like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are creating a square in the outer solar system. That in itself is a looping toroid magnetic field, interplaying with our sun's magnetic field. And this is why we're starting to see a lot of anomalies magnetically. This explains it totally. Now, with that Hunga Tonga eruption, that is a direct effect of electromagnetism. And as the sun changes its frequency, our Earth responds in kind with its magnetic field and the the diff, the potential difference of electrical from the crust up to the outer atmosphere out through the ionosphere and back to the sun now if you can loop all that together you start to see that well every 400 years at least at the minimum cycle not even a 2000 year cycle every 400 years we get massive massive volcanic eruptions it's just part of the cycle Although this cycle, we had an incredibly early one. And it shot a lot of water vapor up there. And here's the thing. This is a no BS assessment, if you're still listening. Thank you for allowing me to try to explain that and, and synthesize three different you know, points of data into that. The amount of water that was injected into the atmosphere in a single event, 10% more in one single day, that didn't all stay at the ground level or even up 15, 20,000 feet. It went up 30 miles to 50 miles above our heads. And the amount that was injected in there was something like 100,000 times to some multi-million times more. They're just unsure right now. But it's like 400,000 or 500,000 times more ice crystals are in that layer of the atmosphere where the ozone breaks down right now. Up to millions. See, they're unsure, and that's what even scares me more is you're supposed to be the top minds on the, on the planet with all these different types of irradiant satellites and swarms up there and all these different kind of particulate measuring satellites and just the bevy of the best technology ever, ever to record every single chemical that's in the atmosphere just as its own layer. And then you can layer those up if you want to use GIS or whatnot and get into integrated NASA software and these things. Once you start to see that they, even with the best technology, they're either totally not coming out with the truth 
about what is up there. Because if you're talking even about 100, I'm going to go way back minimum. Let's go 50,000, which is not even a number I've ever heard. It's it's way lower than any number I've seen so far in terms of the amount of. So if you heard like, ooh, it's a 10x increase. Ooh, it's 100 times more. We're talking about 400,000 times to multi-millions of times more than the average of ice crystals in that layer in the mesosphere. Now, because of this water vapor eruption, it's also changed the temperatures in the Southern Hemisphere to about 12 to 14 degrees Fahrenheit lower across the averages than the normal. This sets up that same condition that's required to have extreme cold temperatures to onset the chemical reaction of the chlorine and the bromine on that oxygen, or it's an O3 ozone atom that'll get ripped off and broken into oxygen. The amount of catalyst up there is going to be something so significant that it is it is going to be the number one news story as we move forward. And the, it's going to let a lot of UVB radiation down to the ground surface. Like the most we've seen in hundreds, plural, minimum of years, up to thousands of years of more v, UVB is going to penetrate down to the ground level beginning in August, then we have seen in 400 or 2,000 years, and that is in just months from now. So you have to wonder, you know, looking back in societies and seeing how history and civilizations have risen and fallen, you got to ask yourself, is it because of these natural factors that have been hidden, like, oh, no, where our tech is so good, we can ride through these natural phenomenon? Because how many times has history been rewritten? If you go 400-year chapters, we got five of those back 2,000 years. I'll even be generous and break that into two 500-year segments. History is murky. But set up for catastrophic food losses across the Southern Hemisphere. The precipitation patterns are going to change globally, which they already have, and this is what you're seeing, and this is what it is. It's in front of everybody's eyes. Like the new atmospheric flow is now in front of you, apparent, visually in front of you, and also measurable through instrumentation. A 10% increase in everything. This is kind of like the year without a summer setup jet stream pattern ransom, and I'm just going to almost finish here. If you go back to the year 1816, oh, and Ransom, you could pull this up too. If you put out year without a summer in a search engine and look up the images that you'll see, or you could put up year without a summer jet stream, just something super simple, a year without a summer jet stream. And it'll show you how the jet stream was an Arctic vortex bending down over all of the New England states and all the way over to Ontario. And they experienced Arctic freezes in late June and early July twice. So this is the kind of bending in the jet stream. So what we're all seeing, so those atmospheric rivers coming into California that that's bending because if it sets up the same way as it did, something would have been blocked going back west over the Pacific Ocean. Because what's going to cause a blocking high to push that type of Arctic temperatures all the way down to New England states in the summer? What we consider the start of summer, like that blocking high would have to be way, way, way north. They would have to stay there for multi months, if not a year or more locked in position. So if that does that, then everything else is going to get out of whack going, you know, around the planet's jet streams. And in New Zealand, they're they're the, the highest recorded ever and their records went back about 200 years. Supposedly from some of the written accounts of those who were there and had translated and dictated uh, Maori accounts of extreme weather and flux and, and this sort of thing. And then it comes in and uh, the colonization and then weather reporting starts then. So it depends, again, you're splitting a hair. Is it 200 years or is it really 120 years? Whatever. Their rain records down there were broken by 8x, eight times more than had ever been recorded ever. Well, that makes sense because that Hunga Tonga eruption was in the Southern Hemisphere at 20 degrees south latitude. And the first place they saw the volcanic afterglow from all the water vapor and ash in the atmosphere 
was New Zealand and, and Antarctica. So there's going to be a huge amount of crop disturbances and crop losses from huge amounts of water coming down. But at the same time, it cools the soils. Your planting and harvesting dates are definitely completely out of flux at that point. And the last thing I'll say, Ransom, is in Brazil, they're trying to plant the second corn crop of the year, but they can't. It's just too wet in many regions in Brazil where they want to plant corn. They're concerned about the corn seeds rotting in the ground versus sprouting because there's so much water. And the barley should be disrupted first. And uh, please talk more about that ozone, because I'm going to try to pull up the article that, I, that you sent me while you, you discussed that, please. Well, it doesn't actually, the, the article I sent you doesn't really talk about the ozone. It talks about the South American uh, or, or the uh, South Atlantic anomaly, excuse me. Um, and well, that's it just all related. Shows this yeah, well, that's why I brought up both of them. But the article, I don't think it says anything about ozone. Uh, but with the, I'm showing it to everybody right now. So the picture that they're showing, it has this big red representation of a hole. Um, and it stretches from Africa all the way over Brazil, exactly right there, all the way over to the Pacific where it touches just a little bit. Um, and, you know, what I thought fascinating about this is because I've heard um, on I don't know how many different topics about, you know, things like this cosmic rays or more elevated particles coming from um, outside of what was normally protected by our magnetic field uh, coming in and destroying uh, vegetation, um, making animals go extinct. I, I mean, on a larger scale than this, but what we're looking at is th this big old thing's happening. And we know that the magnetic field right now is, you know, very small compared to its normal, uh, uh, you know, stretch that it pushes out into space, bouncing all these particles off of us, keeping us safe down here on Earth. Um, but, you know, we know in the past on several occasions, including when the Neanderthals uh, went extinct, that a similar circumstance was happening as, as what's going on right now. And I kind of wanted to point out this article goes through and it tries to, you know, uh, remind you generally that uh, this big pothole in space, as they're calling it, doesn't affect life on Earth. But we know that that is absolutely on its face a false statement. However, it does go into talking about how it will affect low Earth orbit uh, satellites and stuff. And then also I have this article right here from Elon uh, or about Elon Musk saying the next generation of Starlings will be deliberately deorbited due to the glitches or whatever. Um, and the reason I bring this article up is although it doesn't say anything about the magnetic field in there, it does say that they're, uh, you know, that whatever issue they're ha having, but it demonstrates that uh, when we talk about what might happen in the future, like something from the sun, that's something big, this article right here shows you that the, uh, the infrastructure is already planning on having disposable type of satellites and things like that. In other words, they could just put up a new batch after the last batch uh, got thrown back down to the earth or, or glitched out or whatever happened to it. Um, so th this shows you right here with the SpaceX technology, which you, you have to remember is basically a government uh, intertwined agency that does stuff with uh, the government. So, you know, there's probably all kinds of things that we don't even hear about in conjunction with these technologies of a super net of satellites that covers everywhere. Um, and Elon Musk himself has said in the future, there will be no dead zones. In other words, you will be tracked to the ends of the earth. And when you combine that into some of their other plans, i.e. like uh, brain chips, et cetera, um, uh, you kind of see the direction we're going. And I know you didn't want to hear headlines, but I thought you might find some of these interesting if I just went through them. Um, this is a, uh, from the Washington Post here, the UN is coming for your water. And it goes on to talk about that they're having their Paris moment with the United Nations kind of, uh, where they're going to soon be dealing with water as they do climate. In other words, they're going to set up all these organizations and governmental um, you know, bodies that are, are now going to crack down on the world's water. So the United Nations is holding its first in five decades conference on water in New York, a gathering that some call uh, the Paris moment, meaning that the global body could soon for what uh, do for water what it sought to do for climate. 
So you can just see where that's going. And then over here in Los Angeles, hit by a rare tornado. Uh, they haven't Saw seen that. one or seeing that or say it, maybe they haven't seen one, but they're saying this is the strongest one to hit uh, the county since 1983. So it's not something that hasn't happened, but not very rarely. Um, here it is. Uh, Harvard physicists racing to prove that meteorites are alien probes. We've been seeing a lot of that push um, that kind of fits in here in a minute. And uh, all of these uh, leaks of radiation and things to do with radiation. Uh, I don't know if you saw the thing in California where they released 400,000 uh, gallons of radioactive water into the ocean. Uh, here's another one, too. Well, that was into the uh, Mississippi Russia. River. I, I, I did follow that. because uh, That's kind of close to us. That was released into the Mississippi River. Okay, yeah. Or maybe it was two. I don't know. I'll check. I'll make sure in a minute there to verify. Um, uh, and, and then you go through these, uh, you know, what's going on around the world. There are 800,000 marching through uh, Paris. Um, you got uh, – th these are the ones that I really thought that uh, you might have something to say about right here. Here's an article from uh, physics.org. Anthropogenic climate change poses systematic risk to the coffee cultivation. Now, I know you might know something about that, and here's another one before we uh, hear about that. IPPC reports findings suggest how food production must change to cope with the climate crisis. <laughs> and, and then, uh, you know, hundreds of articles about inflation and food prices uh, uh, to boot on top of that. Yeah, can I? That's interesting how you just circled me back to how I started the Adapt 2030 channel. So I, I used to work as a coffee buyer when I lived in Asia, based in Taipei, and would buy single origin coffee out of Myanmar, otherwise known as Burma. Now, the thing about this, and the reason that I got into this studying of cycles of time, Collapses of civilization, rises of civilizations, food abundant times, food lean times, is because of buying coffee in Myanmar. Because when we went up there, I was originally invited to go down and speak because I'd written a bunch of articles with the American Chamber of Commerce in Taipei about doing business because I had gone down there a couple times on my own to fish around literally and see what was there. You know, they were trying to do a lot of uh, – programs to help farmers raise their farm income for the farm gate because the wholesalers would come in at the trucks and only offer one price and that was it and there was no competition and that's the, we'll give you two cents for all of your whole acre of produce and there's like okay there's no buyers okay we're gonna leave by take the two cents or nothing so they got rid of that whole scheme and uh they were trying to figure out how to get the farm gate um you know so i was interested in farming and they were doing fish farming aquaculture I actually got a guy to install a uh, gravitational vortex power plant down there. Won't mention the name, but he's got he had a two meter drop, which is six feet, and uh, I showed him gravitational vortex power, the Zoltlotter principles and Schauberger on how to have water just spin in a circle. You don't dam it at all. You just make it spin in a circle, and that circle then spins a blade and it, it's attached to an alternator or some other kind of generator. Super low tech, super simple, and you never dam the water. You just use it for a few seconds. You use it. You don't dam it. And then you just generate the power. Okay, installed that. Awesome. But the whole thing, when we first started buying coffee there, was the guys that were in charge, they were so honest and so forthcoming with what was happening. I was actually shocked because, like every, a lot of other people, I'd seen the Al Gore movie. I'd watched it and just like wide eyed, like, no way, CO2 is going up, no way. I was a believer for a while until I got down there and they're like, you know what? The bean density of the beans, the like the density is if you're gonna roast and profile, you're gonna have a certain temperature that is gonna cook that bean thoroughly and you won't scorch it and you'll get medium roast, dark roast, whatever you're looking for. Talk to a roaster about that, the density of it. Well, they were telling us that because it was getting colder. We're talking about Burma, Myanmar. It was getting colder. That's from the farmers themselves. A colder. What? Yeah, colder. So these little, these little microspherial drops of water inside the bean would freeze. 
And when it froze, it would expand that pocket and that pocket would never fill back inside the bean again. And you would have all these, uh, the, for a better term, air holes. But they weren't. It was the water that actually froze solid in the bean because of very low temperatures. And because water expands, there's that little bit of extra emptiness in there. After the fiber of the bean, you know, moved around that super hard ice crystal or that ice droplet. So the beans were a different density. So they, if you, they were warning us, if you're going to sell them wholesale, you got to tell the roasters that the bean density is different because um, EMR beans were rated a certain way, but they started to see changes happening. And I was going to ask him, like, well, what are these changes? I don't understand this. Like, it's supposed to be getting warmer. What are you guys talking about? Why are beans suck? And then they started telling us about the top leaf damage. And this is really what it did it for me. Top leaf damage. See, I thought they were trying to, like, throw us over. They're getting, trying to give us some, you know, second quality, third quality, you know, beans. And they're like, oh, there's pockets in them, and this is why, and they still want a premium price and whatever. But then they started to explain the top leaf kill. And I was like, this is what caught me. So when the, the coffee trees are growing, to get up into that second, then especially like the third year, fourth year, fifth year is really uh, start – getting into some good production. So then they have these leaves that were burned literally from the cold on the top of the plants. This stunted growth, which stunted production. So the coffee trees weren't yielding as much either. Now come down to the seedlings that were in there. They, it was When I say greenhouse, I use the term loosely at best. It was shade cloth over huge, vast rows of little coffee trees emerging that are one to two years old. And uh, never really got cold there, so they didn't have to build a greenhouse like we understand it. It would just use shade cloth. And they were saying that you have to overplant your fields by about 14%, 13%, somewhere in that range was the recommended. Because many of those plants are going to succumb to cold. And that's what really did it for me. I was like, and then I was like, whoa, okay, I don't understand this. Like, they shattered my reality in about... You know, one day walking around the coffee farms looking and being explained this. And overplant because of the cold damage. Okay, then, it's, then I found John Casey pretty quick after that. Because I was looking and saying, this is, I don't understand this. And they were, t and the, yeah, the long story short is, they told us their grandfathers had experienced the same thing in the 1880s when they were first starting to uh, commercialize coffee and the British were down there in Burma, you know colonize it and put out all the tea plantations and they were commercializing coffee at the same time. Well, they told us that in all these, all these farms, these landholders, man, they're multi, 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 multi-generation families. They just, yeah, super old, same on the land for a long way back into the mid 1880s. And then I was looking, okay, well, what if it happened in the 1880s and it's happening now, and then you got to realize this is like in like 2012, 2013, 14, you know, you're talking a, a fair bit of history, a, a fair bit of time. So I was thinking it's 100 plus 20 years, something like this. And then I ran into the centennial minimum after talking with John Casey. And he's like, yeah, well, there's these different cycles in the sun because I'd watched a bunch of his presentations and I reached out to him. He was very uh, not well known at that point. He was getting out, trying to get private conferences. He lived down in Florida, and he was just doing it literally, as you would see somebody with a video cam and like a projector and 20 people in the room. And that's what he was starting to try to get this info out was this cycle is going to disrupt the magnetic field. Our jet streams are going out of flow, and we're not going to be able to grow enough food for 8 billion people. That was his message way back then. And of course, he lost a 30-year distinguished career at NASA. I think he was the lead investigator on the on the space shuttle uh, investigation. Like that's the kind of level of credibility he had. John Casey. You gotta uh, take a look at his work, and then once you understand the cycles. So ransom, I went on a long rant there to try to explain about coffee, but I thought, you know, since you were looking for an in-depth answer, because I know you're that kind of deep thinker, I thought I would throw it all out there on the table for you. Well, I knew you might find that, uh, you know, interesting there. But, yeah, they're, they're uh, doing this 
right now and they're and then of course they're going to try to blame it on man-made this and that um when i thought it was funny because this is something that you were, were already dealing with and knew about um right here and then they're they're pushing it off you know like as more propaganda about uh how everything is you know being destroyed by humans uh just living on the earth and that's why we're not going to be able to provide the 8 billion people on Earth with food. They're already setting up the excuses, uh, just like this IPPC report finding, uh, suggesting how, how they're going to change the production of food. Now, what does that mean, um, really? I think what that means is taking it out of the control of kind of how what you started at the beginning is how many Amish farmers do I know? I know zero farmers. The only farmers I know are through the Internet, are people I've met. Uh, since I've kind of, uh, you know, took my ideas of the way things were going and then met people um, that started, uh, you know, mentioning the part about food, which is integral part of anything when you're talking about what you're going to do long term as, as far as survival. And then when I'm just going through, um, you know, these headlines, I see the way that money is becoming worthless and food and items that allow you to live your life outside of their grid. Are, are, it's, is, is drying up. It's the, the money's becoming worthless. The food is becoming more and more expensive. And everywhere I look, I see banks failing. I see bailouts from governments, <laughs> meaning that at any, any time, things are uh, potentially about to pop for you in your area where the opportunity to just go down to a supermarket and buy food is not going to be available. So here's UK inflation rises 10.4 as food prices soar. You got inflation jumps unexpectedly as food prices soar, talking about uh, uh, the, the entire UK. And then in the article, they also mentioned Europe. We also got veggie shortage. So like they're picking on the UK real bad. But if you think about the UK, they're kind of landlocked there. Um, they, they have to depend on other countries for mass amounts of products unless they're going to start growing it themselves there, which they're not. Um, inflation. Everywhere you look, Canada, up in, up in uh, Canada, up in the United States. And, and then you have these uh, things, which I, I don't think it's going to happen, but bipartisan senators push for ban on China from being able to buy U.S. farmland. Uh, watch that one. I don't think they're going to ban them at all. And then this I wanted to get into because it's, it shows the direction of uh, at least where we're going in the U.S., squatters increasingly taking over homes across the U.S. with no end in sight. Experts warn, the experts always. Um, but think about this, that now there are laws set up all across the United States that are left-leaning that protect the people that burglarize, break in, and destroy your property. The law is now on their side in those places where um, if you came home from, you know, going on vacation or maybe you were renting out your home, um, you know, like the Airbnb thing or or whatever the case is, you come home or you go to your property and you find out that there are people living there, destroying your property, living without paying rent, eating up your electricity bills that you have connected, the water, et cetera. Um, and then you call the police expecting the police to remove the trespasser, burglar, uh, squatter, and then they tell you, no, well, we're sorry, the squatter's rights. You know, we're going to have to let them stay in there. We'll, we'll take 30 days to get a thing going with the court. And then by that time, your property is destroyed. So I would suggest, you know, if you do have uh, one of those uh, Airbnb things, at least that you insure it in some way that covers squatters destroying your property um, because the law is no, no longer on your side in a lot of places. But beyond that, just thinking about people destroying your property, um, the arrogance of the masses deciding that not only will they take over the streets, but they'll now take over private properties. And when you look at some of the most mostly peaceful protests <laughs> that have happened in, in, in a few years, uh, you know, close to now, um, private property didn't seem to be protected by uh, the governmental forces and instead was almost, uh, you know, scoffed at that people would protect their own property and and i and i'm i'm sure you know of some of the headlines that uh, arose uh from skirmishes from people trying to burn down properties and stuff like that uh and then you got the banks the banks are giving themselves monies again i mean i don't know i'm not a like i'm not a scientist i'm not a financial expert uh but when i see banks fail 
and then the government come to their aid, but not to the aid of the citizen. When I see uh, the government giving other places, war theaters, billions and billions of dollars, while everything here seems to be, you know, being run down or destabilized um, from coast to coast. Um, now there is a live feed on several platforms of multiple cities uh, that you can watch 24 hours a day with uh, – I'm going to say thousands of people in the in the eye of the public, and that's not counting the people that you don't see that are hidden off places, just d sitting there doing their um, pharmaceuticals um, and and basically becoming zombies. And then you have the governments in those areas uh, saying things like they'll just give them a $1,000 a month. Matter of fact, there are like 12 states right now proposing the idea – that, you know, maybe the answer to all our problems is if you just give everybody a thousand dollars a month and and then we subsidize, uh, you know, housing for them. And then we're, we're going to get into a situation where there's only two people working for two or three or four people taking from the system. And obviously that's not sustainable and that's going to collapse. But you have to ask yourself why the governments are encouraging um, behavior that destroys the city from the inside out. And and then also doesn't help any of the people involved that think that, you know, oh, that's great. I get to sit here and do my drugs, live in my tent, and I'll just get a thousand bucks a month. I don't have to work. I don't have to do nothing. Um, what do you think is going to happen to those people when the food runs out? Of course, they're going to be some of the first people that are cut off, and and then they're going to be needing new resources. And then whenever you have a decade of a fad of uh, governments protecting the squatters and protecting the people destroying private property, what are the homeowners, business owners, farm owners, ranch owners to do at that point? Um, uh, uh, you know, because it, be, it becomes an, a whole thing where they get prosecuted for protecting their livelihood. So I don't know where that's going to go, but I did, uh, you know, you sent me this, um, thing about the ozone here and yeah, i was going to put I'm sorry, it ransom can i jump in there yeah 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 before you jump onto the ozone uh pdf that's my own research that i did uh, that i'll come back to that but yeah you know it's going to be coming down to try to keep security in your own areas too and in tennessee that squatter thing that that, that wouldn't fly are you kidding me imagine if they come out to an airbnb out in the countryside and then like we're going to squat the house <laughs> they'd be out of there like yeah, sure you are. Okay. It just depends on like what the sheriff is like in your town or what the local people are willing to do to get together to kick people out, you know? There's going to be a lot of um, – because if you read back in the Great Depression, they used to have, you know, men mainly that would come in and say, hey, we're looking for work or looking for – and they would travel all together and like, you know, ten groups of 10s, groups of 50s, groups of 200s if you need a large project done or something. But then it got so bad of people squatting and staying and like camping and doing all these things. That even back then, you got to think the Great Depression, just like a few hundred people in town looking for work caused a disruption to the system where they were holding out signs and men keep going. Do not even stop here. Don't even ask for a job. Keep going. Get out of this town. Get out of here before sunset. That was in the 1930s. That's how much it disrupted. Can you imagine now? Ah, we're gonna. You're gonna go back to the. You're going back to the pioneering lifestyle. Your own security. You're gonna have to uh, take that. Because you can imagine about in the Western Plains. Think about that when they were settling the West. You think somebody had just walked into the house of a cattle rancher? Is like this is my house now. <laughs> they was gonna stay there and go. Okay, <laughs> not a chance, man. Not a chance. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, that was my response. I know. As soon as you started talking, I pictured the stagecoach from last week, man, and I can't, I can't, uh, you know, remove my, that from my head because that was a reality for people, and I have a feeling um, that we're gonna, we're getting to a point where that might have to be a reality uh, again. The only problem is, is back then the government was on the side of the people that were protecting the land, um, you know, and that's kind of how uh, you know the posse formed, so to speak. Now. I don't want to live in a, in in any country that uh, you know people kind of do their own justice in, in a large way. However, uh, protecting private property is a fundamental of the whole idea of the the civilization that we we started here, and uh, they're going after each right individually, and it's an obvious assault. And the three main things are private property 
protecting your life and being able to speak your mind. I mean, think about that. No wonder they're trying to convince us that, uh, you know, meteorites and different things are some kind of alien invasion. Uh, I, recently, the Pentagon put out a paper that's supposed to be just a kind of a what if. But I don't know why the Pentagon would need to put out a what if. But they were talking about um, the idea that there's a mothership in our solar system right now probably just sitting there and you know it's letting out little ships and they keep pushing this idea because i think that when all of this turmoil's over uh they're, they're gonna have to have a whole new script a whole new religion a whole new set of ideas uh for people to live under and whatever that's going to shape out to be whichever scenario they pick it seems to be where we're all locked down in this little area like zoo animals um, you know, uh, from the 15 minute city to the megalopolis idea, they have all of these ideas and they already have maps drawn up of where they're going to move people out to create bio zones. I'm sure you're familiar with the Agenda 21, Agenda 30 ideas. And they kick that into overdrive with this World Economic Forum. And they're not hiding any of the stuff that they're they're planning on doing. It's amazing to me that, you know, you can still get banned for certain talking about certain things. And I've come to the conclusion that if you make a video or a radio show or where, wherever you're at and you get banned for that, you must have struck a nerve. You must have said something that had some kind of truth in it um, because there's only certain topics that they just won't let you talk about. And, you know, aliens ain't one of those. You could say all you want about uh, what you believe the secret government's doing. You notice they don't really, uh, you know, we used to have stories of the men in black that would show up to the witnesses and tell them don't do that. We don't have that anymore. Now we have the somebody's in the algorithm that says, hey, you can't say that. You can't think that. You can't share that. We don't want people thinking about that, and we'll tell you uh, what you need to think about that topic. And it's becoming more and more like that, and now they're introducing the idea of technology, technology helping them control the minds of the masses. And we've talked about many of those kind of technologies on here, um, but the simplest one is the pack mentality. And that one is easy to, to stroke that out of the civilization, and all you have to do is remove food and slowly remove that, or it, even not even removing it to the point where people starve, but just removing it enough where people panic. You can cause massive amounts of uh, social change in that. Um, but I have a feeling that they know that food shortages are coming, and it's something that they not only are not going to control as far as why it happens, um, but I don't think they'll be able to really control the aftermath like they think they will. However, that's not stopping them from making these plans and trying to form um, these new societies that are based on a feudalistic system where the king and queen are removed from the equation and some algorithm or some board of people that are unelected somewhere decides is what's going to happen from everything like I showed you the article about water. They're coming for the water, but we've already known that because we've had local uh, jurisdictions try to use these uh, global ideas in local areas and charge people for stealing water that fell out of the sky or saying people can't collect water on their own land. So at some point uh, in mass, everybody's going to have to say no. I, I don't know when that's going to happen or what will make it happen, but it seems to be a necessity. Yeah, the necessities are going to be, because you talked about the world under assault, and I was going to say, is that Himalayan salt, iodized salt, or sea salt? I'm trying to keep it positive and just throw a joke into that, because sometimes we need light humor in these ridiculous uh, view of reality conversations. Like, if you would have the same conversation even five years ago, they would have thought you so mad that they would have bought two insane asylums for you but now you have to think about that manifestation capability that you're talking about you know what is that that drives is it the food is it the media that's driving that to convince you it's food is it the industrial complex funding wars that stop the flow of foods in conjunction with said media outlets but then the way the reality is created is by using the, the human thought in the resonance field to take that thought and create reality times 8 billion or 7 billion. Just by even, even if you're in a, in a nation that does not have TV or electricity uh, 
like higher in the Himalaya or I don't even care where you are in Africa, you're still getting printed media for sure. There's newspapers and things. So those stories in a written form are even more powerful than what you see on the visuals because your imagination creates that, plugs it in. That's why when you read a book and you see a movie, it's never the same. And you're always like, oh, that was a terrible movie. It's not, nothing like I remember reading the book. Same, same, but different. We need to create a positive future, which we will. We're coming back in a couple minutes here. Enjoy the break. We'll see you back in a couple minutes. Many Ice Age Conversations.
listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Any commercial advertising you may hear in this program is of the sole discretion and benefit of the host of whose program you are listening to. Revolution Radio does not endorse any commercial products, nor does it accept monetary compensation for on-air advertising of commercial products, nor will it ever. We are and shall remain 100% listener supported. Any product advertising on this program are considered used at higher risk, and Revolution Radio shall not be held liable for any claims or damages received from any product advertised within this program. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Thanks for listening while we took that short break here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. And now we're going to get back to your host. And welcome back to the second hour of many Ice Age conversations. David Dubine right here with Ransom Godwin. Oh, how does this world move a year without a summer? Two fruits or two vegetables purchased. We'll have your bag checked at the uh, self-checkout. The things on my plate right now are trying to install a tin roof on the top of a barn. You know, these types of things. So where does it come into with this bigger picture? You know, are we, I was saying before the break, are we really being led down this road to create the reality that is the news for those pushing and having the influence of the control of the words in the news given to the world's populace each day. By those words creating images or imaginations in the mind, your mind then plays that and creates the reality in front of you times a billion, which is the one whole reality that those with the puppet strings across the words delivered across the planet daily weekly, monthly, have turned into something that's a wider whole versus the individual events. See, all those tiny little individual events are actually made to culminate to the whole. So that's how we're going to start the second hour. Ransom, thanks for joining me. Uh, I remember you had asked a question, and, oh, you were going to show something about the ozone hole because I thought there were some cool pictures in there about the ozone column and the depletion and how slowly it repaired itself last year. Yeah, I opened up this uh, PDF that you got here, uh, Opportunity Cycle. And it shows all these cool graphs on here. Ozone hole development of 2022. Yeah, I do that research oh, myself. You. Those, That's my own newsletter that uh, I take a subject each month and delve into it deeply. You know, I was just, uh, it's, I was reading this while the break was going on and it, it seems very bizarre to me that uh, it, it, well, I guess you could call me a conspiracy theorist, but that certain technologies all come up at the same time. Like I was looking at this other uh, article here that says physicists manipulated quantum fo photons. And basically what they're claiming is for the first time um, they've successfully manipulated small numbers of light particles, uh, photons, and, that they're manipulating. And then now if you read in the article, they're bragging that, oh, well now, you know, now that they do that, they can uh, create all these medical scanning devices. Um, and, you know, that sounds great, but what they're really talking about is a new technology that would allow them to look through anything, meaning your home, your car, what, what, whatever. And then, and then the ideas just go on because what we're talking about here is kind of when science fiction uh, becomes reality because this is the same technology that they talk about in the show Star Trek as what they use like on their tricorders and their little me medical instruments. You know how they used to show them or they'd just scan you and find out what was wrong with you. That's exactly what they're talking about um, this technology making. And not only that, uh, you know, if you could control photons in this manner, which they're claiming that they have, um, you could make weapons that can't be detectable. In other words, like a phaser that you shot at someone that no one even saw. And then that person, uh, who knows what they can do with this uh, uh, technology. But it, it's really bizarre to me that 
they're having a lot of uh, revelations when it comes to electricity, magnetism, uh, and all of these other ideas. And then the machines that they're building, when we're coming into a time that it, it seems like, you know, this would be pretty bizarre because the odds on us uh, losing a technical technological civilization due to the sun's activity uh, seems like a, a stronger and stronger um, idea that will will happen eventually to our society. I don't know when, um, but if that did happen, it seems to me like all of these articles are just a kind of a way to allow the elite that kind of read each other's stuff. If you know how they used to work that way, they would write a book, they'd make 300 copies. Um, certain people would get it, and that way, none of the peasants or peons ever got to understand the ideas um, that some of these people are having. And and this is like a milk toast version of it, because really, what they're talking about is fundamentally understanding or manipulating quantum light. And if you know how quantum uh, computers are, the the whole idea between quantum computing, uh, excuse me, is that they're using photonic. Um, energies back and forth. So um, they're using that to predict things and, and uh, uh, you know, calculate and simulate things um, that we don't know about. Um, but then every other week they give us, uh, you know, another strong warning that just our regular activity uh, on Earth as humans, you know, uh, this is turning out to be just like a science fiction movie where all of the great tech comes out right at the time that there's the most uh, cultural turmoil and problems with, uh, you know, feeding everyone. It seems like a, a well-developed plan, in my opinion. And I know this is kind of a, a sidetrack from um, your paper here, um, but the idea that you can manipulate uh, light really brings me to the idea of um, speciation and extinction due to cosmic rays and solar particles at different times, which that links into this whole idea about the, o the ozone hole and the South Pacific uh, anomaly there, where we're, we're getting to see in real time that it is a possibility that things can dramatically change on Earth in a short period of time. And when you compare it to other times in our history that we know about, and I brought the Neanderthals up, it seems to be looking like that they just didn't have a, the right gene in their skin to protect them from this kind of radiation, which may have been the reason that they all disappeared after 400, 450,000 years of uh, uh, having a presence in Europe and stuff. And if you really think about uh, when they talk about modern man, um, you know, the example of Cro-Magnon is only like 35,000 years old, and that's the first one that they're saying is a modern, anatomically correct, and uh, an actual modern human being versus the anatomical um, humans that they talk about, because they, they do distinct that there is a modern human, and then there's an anatomically correct human that was living for a long time that's supposed to be our predecessor or whatever. Um, but the emergence of one a species of human all of a sudden dominating the earth at the same time as these other species um, disappear and everybody wondered what happened but then we're getting more and more um, you know information out of different studies that seems like a, a cosmic catastrophe event happened to them about 40,000 years ago which um, conveniently helped humans our, our kind of humans uh, develop the earth but who's to say that um, it, if it happened again that a large portion of the population of animals, plants, and human beings wouldn't have the necessary genes to survive that. And if so, wouldn't that be a perfect opportunity for technologies to emerge? I don't know, like crisping and gene editing and uh, messenger uh, RNA and uh, you know things like that to just pop up at the right time to take over or hijack a natural process that undoubtedly the scientific community knows about as a whole. The ozone blinds with the UVB. Because I, I'd kind of gotten off topic explaining that the UVB that's about to penetrate the Southern Hemisphere in amounts that we haven't seen, like I said, for hundreds, plural, or thousands, plural, of years. You're talking about different light sensitivities and different energy or energetic signatures on a particle, energy itself as light, 
but also weight and density, plasmas. There's many ways that energy can be transformed. And it's not just, you know, you're burning a rock or, you know, it's, there's many ways that energy exists in our universe here. But you also need that combination of, if you're going to have electricity, you need the magnetism. Can't have one without the other. Can't have the magnetism without the electricity. You know, they create the fields around each other for one to move through the other symbiotically know us, which is the trippiest thing. Like we, we barely even understand what electricity is, but to try to understand on a galactic level with how many, you know, what you say, galactic cosmic rays are broken down into so many different particles that would shake your head. It's not just a proton. It's not just an alpha. It's dozens and dozens of different substances with densities and energy intertwined with that density that is not, it's a particle and it's, but they come ripping through the earth here. Different densities had different changes energetically on, like you say, DNA, these types of uh, functions with our bodies would change. And then the biggest thing is the light photosensitivity. Because you have to think about UVB is going to be a much brighter, whiter light. Like, you know, you look at a yellow sun setting in the sunset, it's red, it's, or it's yellow, and then it's red, and then it goes down. Like you can look at it at that point and it feels real comfortable. But you know, sometimes in the middle of the day, now double that intensity of, oh man, I can't even be out here. What's that going to do to the insects and the birds? And how about as, as the humans? You know, Australia was always talking about the ozone hole as long back as I can remember. That you got to put on SPF 500 because you're going to burn in the Australian sun, cover you every inch. Got to be in the sun. You got to be out before 10 o'clock. Got to get out of the surf. You're going to fry like a lobster. You're going to get cooked, put into a microwave oven and come out baked if you don't get out of the water by 10. And like from 10 to 2, 2.30, 2 you need to stay out because it is a microwave oven. That's kind of the light version of what's about to happen anyway. So the animals, insects, and people are going to be affected. What about people out in the fields? or visually affected pilots and drivers and all these types of things. Like it goes way more than just an insect in the field, not being able to pollinate, being completely disoriented. Maybe something will thrive. A, a predator insect at this time will come and just devastate and ravage everything else. Plants have a difficulty growing. There's smaller yield on the plants and it's all dependent on how much the ozone hole increases in size, increases in size. But that amount of sea ice, if I might say, Ransom, that last thing I want to talk about here, just an elephant in the room for everybody on this one. The scientists will not be able to explain it. But at the same time, in conjunction, because there's so much UVB radiation hitting ground surface, Ice absorbs that really well and melts very quickly, comparatively, without that extra radiation of the UVB hitting ground surface. Now when you look back and you go, whoa, low ice, then you start to look and go, whoa, how was the ozone hole? And there's suddenly a match up there. The wider the ozone hole, 30 million square kilometers, and there's record low sea ice. Wow, and now we're gonna see it again. That sea ice is going to go bye-bye. But what they're not going to talk about is the massive record all-time gains of ice and snow on Antarctica, the continent private. The sea ice would totally disappear. I'm not going to say totally, but there's going to be some massive radiation hitting that sea ice surface. It's going to melt it. That'll be the main story. Look at that. Prove global warming. The sea, our Antarctic sea ice is melting. Oh, it's the lowest ever. It's below the lowest ever. It fell off a cliff. Well, yeah, it did. But you forgot the whole point about the entire ozone column breaking down to the point where it's destroying plant life on the planet. On the bottom southern half of our world where we can't grow crops as efficiently, that whole thing of that UVB radiation hitting the ground, you forgot about that. They're going to still blame it on CO2. Watch it. Watch it. But the whole thing uh, it just results in less food being produced, I mean, by 30 to 50 percent. Southern hemisphere production, not global. Southern hemisphere production, 30 to 50 percent down. And even South Africa just recently was saying they're down 35 percent on their corn for the year. But they're a major exporter to inter-Africa. 
So I don't know where it takes us, but you know, you can see many things in field and it's all going to be pinpointed. Like you said, right back at mankind. You're the cause baby limit of one because you're the cause and see how the writing on top of the natural cycle. Yep. Seems like the internet's cutting out on on our, our broadcast there. I was looking at it skipping past where it was supposed to be. Um, you, the, the thing I wonder about is, you know, with all of these numbers that I, I hear all the time, uh, which is like 20% of this, 35% of that, you know, how does that add up kind of in a big picture? Because if you really think about, the amount of people on earth, I, I've studied a lot about this population uh, idea and the, the idea that it was going to plateau right about this time anyway. So there is a big portion of that, a, a percentage that's elderly people in, um, in their lifetime, and they are all going to leave the planet close to the same time as far as in dec decades. So the number will reduce. Plus, you have the idea of uh, decreased amounts of people in certain places having children. And then when you add on these ideas that we talk about, uh, which is basically cutting down the dinner plate uh, on average of the world population, you have to ask yourself, where is the excess food going to come from? Or is that the overall plan is to reduce the amount of food, especially in the third world, uh, um, using different kinds of uh, you know excuses or reasons, uh, not having anything to do with the natural cycle, but then adding the natural cycle of problems on top of that, like ozone holes, um, flooding and, and fire and, and different things that they can keep contributing to more and more uh, reasons why there's not food. Where in the end does this chunk of the population, because when we're talking 20, 30 percent of this and that, I'm viewing this idea of at the end result of the population, there's going to be a percentage of people. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 30. I don't know what it is. Um, but those people are going to start having issues because of lack of food. So where is that food going to come from? And what's that really going to look like uh, when the world starts recognizing that a large percentage of this 8 billion people start to disappear off the planet? Um, one way, obviously, that they hide those numbers is through war. Um, and, and, and as you've seen in the past couple of decades, they try to hit every single storm or any kind of natural disaster as some part of this man-made uh, global warming idea. Um, and so who, who is the, the biggest boogeyman that they're going to put it on, in your opinion? You think it'll be like some kind of thing like the ozone reduction or um, – or are they going to just try to spread out the excuses? And and what do you think that number is going to be? Like, right, for, first off the bat, if something happened, uh, you can pick your poison. Super volcano, okay, or, you know, not a super volcano like Yellowstone, but like a big explosion. Or uh, uh, massive wars in different areas. How much is the percentage of, do you think, the people – on the earth, because we're not going to be looking at it like you're not going to look at your neighbors and go, oh, well, you know, one out of 10 of us starve to death. It's not going to be like that. It'll be different places around the world. But how long until you think the world populace catches on that the reduction of the population is on top of the natural drop in it? It's kind of my question to you, if that made sense. Yeah, and I would kind of respond saying that. They're going to blame all of us again. And where it's going to come from, the economy is going to completely stop. Because you have to think about it just for a second here. The whole movement to central bank digital currencies, the whole changeover from the Western bloc nations, for a better term, as you know, is central banking and this sort of thing, is shifting over to 80-plus new nations that agree to pledge natural resources against issued currencies that have some physical backing behind it, gold, oil, uh, proven metal resources, whatever. I'm going to pledge this from our country as a physical commodity in your basket of currency that's all backed by something tangible. 
and a huge amount of the world's moving away over to that direction. But there needs to be some stoppage for a moment in time to say that it doesn't work anymore to reset to a new system. I mean, this ozone hole, this ozone catastrophic collapse is the perfect cover for this year to do it. I do believe that, just for a quick FYI about ozone holes, the average ozone hole season is August, September, October, November in the Southern Hemisphere. If you go back, historical records, shoot, even in the 1700s, they talked about the sun getting super intense. You know, take that with what you would do more like the satellite era or recorded records back 150 years, or you can go back into sailors' logs, etc. It is going to create such a disruptive event, the ozone hole depletion, UVB radiation, that it'll be measurable. It'll start scorching stuff like plants will get burned. Like imagine that with how they can use and run with that. Now, again, it's going to be part of they're never going to come back to chlorofluorocarbons again. It would never work. So what they're going to keep running with is somehow – the, the CO2 didn't make the temperature rise as predicted, but it, oh, it had this other effect of depleting ozone or something like this. Something like this. Now, will the sun be included in the explanation? Mm, probably not. With the volcanic eruption from Hunga Tonga with the 10% ejection of water vapor into the atmosphere in a day, explain it? Um, probably not. They're going to run it the they're going to run full sprint on this one. They're going to start blaming everybody as soon as the ozone. And the reason I was saying, got sidetracked again. I'm, I'm like that sometimes when I'm thinking. Ozone hole generally August, September, October, November is the average. Now, I would anticipate it this year starting way early. Way early. If there are hundreds of thousands of times more ice crystals in that layer of the atmosphere and the mesosphere, that breakdown ozone with that chemical reaction of chlorine and bromine up there, like 30 miles up above our heads, 100,000 X of the normal up there means something's going to fall off a cliff so fast, the instant it has a chance to even catalyze, it's gone. Like there's going to be no lead up to it, and then suddenly, you know, you're at the, the densest, oh, and there's so many ice crystal clouds, and it's so slowly, you know, built up over the winter, and it got that cold for a few days, and there was some breakdown on things. This is going to go... All gas, no breaks from July because it's fully saturated. So any reaction at all will break down ozone from the very first second it's cold enough. And being, like I say, 12, 14 degrees Fahrenheit below the normal. And that's the chart I was going to pull up for you. Damn, okay, give me a second and I'll get that one for you. It's going to start immediately. Like this whole contagion of what's considered banking, it's nothing more than a transference into the new BRICS system, but keeping enough operating capital in the old system here in our banks to keep it propped up and keep it functioning with the faith, the faith of the government behind that backing it with something is still there for many, 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 many people. It's the country, it's backing it. Well, the new the new system's begun. It's a non-dollar denominated world. The, the shift we just witnessed was that. This whole culmination of everything you've seen from the COVID right up to now with the economic, that was a movement away from dollarization on an agreed of block of countries of 80 plus now that are going to pledge minerals and gold and silver and anything they can oil into this. That was a swift movement over. Now, since the movement has begun, uh, there's going to be, let's say, collateral damage along the way financially for almost everybody in the Western world. What better way to cover? The food shortages. See, that's the whole thing is learning about, you know, from John Casey's work and talking with him and interviewing him and talking with others after that and learning truly what these solar cycles meant in terms of civilization. Would you not ride on top of one of these cycles? Like if I was any lead and I was like, you know, multi-thousand year family, I had all this information at my fingertips in a private library somewhere. 
always adding to it new archaeological discoveries and finds to the family collection. You would know exactly when these cycles were started. You couldn't salvage it anyway because what we're seeing right now with the jet streams and the cloud cells going so ferociously awry that everybody's noticing it. But that was a result of atmospheric disturbance from the Hunga Tonga eruption linked back to electromagnetic changes from the sun and the actual. So as we start swinging around here, we're going to get another coupling of Jupiter and Saturn as we come into the second magnetic field here in April. So I'm, I'm going to show what is it? Today it's the 23rd. So the new earthquake window, I call it an earthquake window. It's going to start appearing right here in the first week of April, probably like the 8th or 9th of April through the end of the month because Jupiter recouples with the Earth as well as Saturn does and Neptune's now getting into the picture electromagnetically. So as we swing around into October of 2024, all four planets electromagnetically will be interacting as its own field with the Earth in addition to the Sun. So we're getting a second, albeit much smaller than the sun's magnetic field. Understand it's a second magnetic field in the solar system interplaying and becoming stronger. It's a transference. Nothing's going to zero. That electromagnetic potential is now moving to that new magnetic field. Because remember, you need the magnetic field to create the electricity, the electricity or electric field. You need them to interplay on each other. So think of the solar system no different than you know, wires coming into your house. That transference, it's the same exact thing with the transference of wealth out of the Western system over into the new bricks. As much as it is the Earth's or the, the sun's magnetic field and equalizing with or blending in with and more interplaying with this new magnetic field setting up in the outer solar system. That's the known you would know that you couldn't produce enough food. You look through history and have thousands of years more records and more private information that's released at universities than we can get our fingertips on. It's in, it's in family private collections, never to be viewed by public. The cycles are known. So the, the cycle on sets exactly like it, you know we've been talking about here. What would you want to accomplish to move society? Because you knew after this grand solar minimum cycle would finish a new world would be, be evolving or emerging anyway, just because the old one was completely ripped to shreds, not able to grow food for, you know, four or five years on the planet, enough to feed everybody. We're not talking like 30 days or 30 weeks. We're talking like years, several years, not a decade, not like one year or two years, a little bit longer in that four or five year range. If you knew that information clearly of when it was on setting, you could accomplish anything. You could create the contagion at the exact same time. And if you noticed that right when the COVID came in, right when the banking crisis in 2019 with the overnight repo rates and there wasn't enough liquidity back then, suddenly we have the world's largest event that creates the most liquidity ever. And all these collapses are happening on the same overlapping cycle and the same entry into this grand solar minimum on schedule. Then the entire world responds in the exact same years within one year or two years of each other of when this grand solar minimum was set to be officially noticeable and calculable and measurable it was around 2020. And within these three years, you've seen how much change there has been in everybody's lives and just the way the world operates completely it's so much more than you could it's blown everybody's minds open how much it's changed so quick and how vast the change is and how that was three years now throw in the food shortages with it and what you could what could you control at that point well you could control the new money you could set it up so everybody goes digital or you don't get a digital rationing card and you can't go to a store to purchase your rations when the food is lean that's where they're going with this, too. At the same time, you know, there's so many facets, there are many roads, many pathways and alleyways that they keep exploring with how to harvest the energy of a human. See, when I saw that movie way back in the day, uh, what was that? Keanu Reeves, The Matrix. The concept of a battery being plugged in. Okay, I got it for the behemoth of the machine. I get it. 
it, it's sort of like you think, okay, well, that's just office workers, like a CEO of a company or a high level official. Okay, it's just somebody working at the company. They're like uh, sitting at desk cubicles. You know, what would you call them? Cubicles. So in the mind, it's like a cubicle. Yeah, okay. And then they're working there and they're harvesting your labor because you're working at the office 40 hours a week. And okay, that kind of harvesting. But I'm starting to see it as the plug in level of all of the stimulus here is getting you to vibrate in a certain form and some ethereal energy is feeding off of that as a battery. And I'm going to leave it there, Ransom. I think I went a little too far on the explanation, but hey. Yeah, I think that is what it is. It's, uh, we, you know, even though that movie was talking about it in an actual electric, uh, you know, charge, there's really no way you can't think of the public as a battery as far as that they put in their time, resources, taxes, et cetera, into the system that's not looking out for them at the same time as being deluded by a fake reality around them. Um, you know, I saw this uh, video the other day where I forgot where the guy went, but he went into some kind of event and inside there they had, you know, several stores like a Starbucks and some other things. And he came in and he pulled out his wallet and he was trying to get a coffee. And they said, sorry, no cash. And he was like, well, what do you mean there's no cash? And they're like, we don't take cash. It's uh, card only. And so he went looking around at the other places. So they had the whole area there where you couldn't use cash. And he was baffled because he brought every denomination of dollar with him uh, just so that he could, you know, make purchases uh, for closer to that amount. And he wouldn't have to uh, break out big bills or use his cards. Um, but that is the kind of future that they are definitely setting up. And whenever you combine the ideas of welfare, of uh, the states trying to push for, uh, you know, a universal income that people just get for being alive, and they never tell you where the money is going to come from. Well, obviously, the money comes from those people that produce, but you can see how they could just switch over to this new system and instantaneously everybody around the world that is not liked by their government or, you know, whatever reason, or uh, they, they have to exclude them from the new uh, system can just be turned off at any moment. So not only could you not use cash after they got rid of that, but the idea that they now have every bit of power of your purchasing, uh, you know, world under their fingertips where you cannot buy food, you cannot travel. And to think that that system that's going on in China right now is not going to happen here is kind of naive because you see all of the other indicators of a, a late, you know, a Marxist uh, cultural revolution happening in the U.S. But this time it's being backed by the current sitting government, which is, you know, you got to scratch your head. Why would governments, and not just ours, but other governments, go out of their way to make their sales fail. It's like if you owned a uh, multi-billion dollar company and all you did is tell everyone not to work and not to show up and not to make stuff. And you know what? We're going to overcharge everyone and we're not even going to deliver. Um, that company would go out of business, but it can't when the system is designed exactly to do that. And it looks like for every avenue, they're trying to sew up any loophole out there uh, for the regular common man to live his life and have a backup uh, safety net, uh, food, money. And it looks like the only way that people are going to make it through a transition when they get rid of the fiat currencies around the world and go over to these digital systems is that if they have actual gold and silver. Um, and I don't even have that much of that. But I know from just reading history as an amateur history reader, that ever since human civilization began, gold and silver have always been money. And not only that, they've always retained about the same amount of value in societies uh, throughout the time period. So like uh, a bar of gold now can probably get you the same amount of stuff as a bar of gold did in, you know, like, I don't know, Roman era. Uh, the gold, even in the 20s, they, remember I uh, a week or maybe it was a couple of weeks ago, I, I read the story that was talking about how in the 20s, if you had enough gold to go buy a suit, you could get a suit for, you know, $20. Um, and now that same suit is $2,000, but it takes the same amount of gold to buy the suit still. It hasn't changed in value uh, much in either way, meaning that that's a constant money. So the next thing I'm expecting really is for the governments to start cracking down on private ownership of precious metals. 
Uh, and they can use any number of excuses to do that as well, like they can do the food. Uh, I remember one time you mentioning how much silver was in one of these high-tech missiles uh, that are getting blown up all the time. And if you think about them increasing war, well, you know, they need these these uh, precious metals to make their gizmos and gadgets in order to keep this uh, this uh, style of military industrial complex wealth going. Um, and so you could just see in the future that money it won't be worth anything. And I've, and I've been noticing that people have bought things and now those same things, uh, the prices are going up. So like I recently bought a, a, an RV and I'm looking and I'm seeing the same RV, uh, old older versions of the same RV going for more money than I paid for that one. And that was only a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think, uh, Gold above $2,000 an ounce today is definitely sending a message that, you know, things have changed. Like I said, this milking of the U.S. dollar and bringing us away or milking our wealth away into a new monetary, you know, alliance and legions all based on pledged commodities called the BRICS. Definitely at the end of an era, you have to think about, as I was speaking in one of my podcasts last week, what well, we consider the opulence that was built after World War II, all that money, technology, jobs, uh, all of it that went into the U.S. and the Western world, as you understand it, Canada, Australia, England, the U.K., all that money went in there and had built out that area of the world. Now, you think about credit and debt and how we did all that with all the debt issued from all the families that need this, that, and the other businesses building and expanding and all that well that cycle has kind of run out they run out of consumers for it because well things run their course there's a shelf life on it so i would think and envision some of the what you consider the poorest countries of the world today like let's say in ghana or someplace in niger uh afghanistan will be another one super poor and you know where are the poorest countries in the world and now if we focus where are the poorest countries in the world in Africa, those are going to have the opulence and uh, lifestyle equivalent of America. That's going to be the, the switch at the end of the eight, 70 to 80 year cycle, the fourth turning this time. So it's run its course, literally has run its course. The human labor is no longer needed to continue this course of action at this velocity and this size and scope. So, it's going to be reduced. Human resources says 50% of the labor force got to go on the entire planet. Whoever's here, 50% got to go. It's too much to carry. Milk everything out on the way out. The gold, like you say, has always held its value and it still sits here. Do you think people would turn in the gold? I mean, there's a lot more information out here now these days. I mean, if you, you know, there's many ways to do it. You could bang on somebody's door and go, give me the gold. Uh, gold's so small. I mean, shoosh. Like, where, where are you going to hide an ounce out on? Even if you had a regular, like, American house on just a regular average neighborhood, like, uh, go hide a one-ounce gold round out there where nobody can find it. And you could easily do that in a wherever your yard is or in your house somewhere. That's easy. Nobody's going to come in looking for an ounce of gold. They're either going to scare people into doing it or they're going to offer absurd prices for you to sell it in. And that'll take, you know, a lion's share out of the market and bring it back into the government hands. So would they come for, uh, you know, would they outlaw go like they did in 33? Not sure. How would you contain and control your wealth? Like, let's say that did happen. How would you control your wealth? Because you see... Uh, Operation something, uh, stop cryptocurrency transactions. We saw the five crypto banks fail in the last two weeks. So all those banks that you saw, like Signature and, and the California SVB, and was that Three Arrows Capital, like those, all those banks were crypt, mainly crypto banking banks. So all the anybody who was involved in the crypto space no longer has an on-road or an off-road to take that money from the crypto world and convert it into U.S. dollars. And then put that in play in the in the rest of the real world through SWIFT system. Like all that on-road off-ramp there, there, that's totally just shut. Oh, except for central bank digital currencies that will be coming in. 
So what is going to be a, what is a way to a medium of exchange moving forward? If the cryptos are being cut off with all of the CFTC looking into things and changing, you know, as they're moving along here, uh, the banking system with the inflation and then gold and silver. I mean, how, what are you going to try to keep your hedge your protection, you know, so you have something at the end of it. So when you do come out on the back end here or during this time, you would always have something to trade or bargain with. It's a never-ending question, man. It's, I'm sure it's changed through history many, many, many times. How far do you think this economic failure is going to go here? Because I'm looking at an article right now by RT talking about another 50 U.S. banks could fail, uh, according to an ex-Lehman banker. So we're, we're getting into the whole, and I was just looking at a graph a minute ago, by the way, of the money that the central banks move around to bail out the banks. And it hasn't been, it's like the beginning of 2008, basically. I mean, like if you look at the graph, you have this uh, half pyramid about 2008 where they were giving all this money, giving all this money, and then it kind of wore off. And then uh, now we're back where the, top amount of money going out on the graph so you can see the little another half pyramid starting and it's already more than what was going on at the beginning of the 2008 financial crisis uh so if that continues like that you could see i don't know how many billions of dollars just disappear again um they're already talking what is it 160 billion dollars uh right now um, how far could they just keep disappearing money and and how could anyone even know where it goes um, if everything is turned over to digital zeros and ones? That's kind well, of I got the, your the answer. I have, your, I have your answer. Just, okay. I'm going to interject for two seconds and then if you could respond to this. See that this whole, you know, headlines, 50 banks may fail. It's like, hurry up, take all your money out of the small banks and regional banks and put it into to the semi systemically. Uh, immobile banks there, uh, JP Morgan and the bigs that'll never fail. They used to call them too big to fail. Now they now they call them systemically important bank. See how they even changed the lexicon on that because they couldn't hoodwink you twice in 2008 and nine with too big to fail. But really, once they hoover up all the money and it's in the systemically important banks, the SIBs or the too bigs to fail, after everybody's herded into that, then those four are going to take everybody straight into Fed now and the Fed coin. One bank. So you, you think literally the idea is to consolidate all the money into one central bank. I mean, obviously, whenever you say the word central bank in the first place, that was always the intended idea as for a central bank for the entire world. But if it's digital, it's kind of what I was talking about. Is is you you know how these uh, scams before with stocks where they would take like a percentage of a penny out of it and no one noticed for a long time until it became a big thing. Th this seems like something similar. What is going to be happening now? Meaning even the the value of these digital uh, increments of of monetary uh, stuff is it's only provably worth something to them. I mean, how does any lay person even know if they're losing money over time through, you know, it just disappearing into the digital space? Uh, if you know what I mean, I mean, literally, um, it's kind of like if you've ever watched Rick and Morty, um, he goes and he he uh, collapses the entire galactic empire by changing their monetary system from one unit to zero units. And, you know, then everybody was going crazy because the money wasn't worth anything overnight. It seems like kind of a scenario. And what's funny about that also is they insinuate when that happens, all of a sudden, you know, all these aliens invade Earth and stuff and stuff's going on, which kind of I know that has nothing to do with the money. But what do you think that the global digital currency would be worth if some kind of mothership showed up as the Pentagon is suggesting is possible? I mean, just the whole idea of a, um, I, I, because they've always said this idea that if we knew there was extraterrestrials, it would fundamentally change the fabric of civilization. So 
you know, and knowing that that's an idea that us on the ground cannot ever prove, um, if they tried to use this idea, which it seems that increasingly that that's the, that's the long term goal eventually is to uh, convince everyone on Earth that they need to endlessly work and pay for something they can't prove or uh, uh, even know about, which is similar to mad made global warming. It's something that, you know, uh, individual person. Ransom, the internet dropped out for a second. 